Casual Birder Podcast, a weekly podcast for people interested in wild birds. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I try to find time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. Join me each week to hear about the birds I've seen, interviews with others, and stories from listeners around the world. This week, my guest is Paul Cheel, host of Fighting Through Podcast. He tells us about the birds he sees in his Norfolk garden. And following on from my last episode, there's some further tips about feeding garden birds. It's early January, and I was pleased this week to hear and see the beginnings of courtship behaviour amongst the birds in my garden. One morning, I noticed a great tit singing its two-toned song loudly, and it immediately made me think of the brighter mornings to come, the longer days and sunnier weather. Of course, we still have much of winter to live through, but I can dream, can't I? I was also very excited to see some courtship behaviour amongst the rooks in my garden, behaviour that I've never seen before. I was drawn to the window by the scolding sound of a magpie and saw three rooks and two magpies in the garden. Two of the rooks were eating seed from the ground feeders and a third was eating from the hanging coconut suet feeder. The magpie had been scolding because it wanted to get to the suet but was afraid to challenge the rook that was already there. As I watched, the rook pulled the coconut up by its string holder and in the process freed it from the hook it was on and dropped it on the floor. This spooked the rook, which then flew over to the other two at the ground feeders, leaving the magpie to rush in and eat some of the suet from the fallen feeder. Male and female rooks look very similar, although there might be a slight size difference. However, the following behaviour helped me realise that there were two males and one female in the garden. While it appeared to me that rook number three just wanted to get some seed from the ground feeder, one of the other rooks seemed to want to prevent him from doing so. He rushed several times at the third rook, forcing it to retreat. And each time rook number three tried to re-approach the feeder, rook number one prevented him. Then I realised that the defending rook wasn't just guarding the feeder, it was guarding the female as well. Which, by the way, just continued eating through all of this. The defending rook kept getting between the third rook and the female on the feeder. It fanned its tail, dropped and opened its wings slightly and strutted in front of both the female and the other rook. It did this a few times until rook number three moved off elsewhere in the garden. Then it went to the second feeder, got a beak full of seed and fed it to the female rook, which she accepted. So I guess these two are already a pair. The male did this again until the rooks were spooked by something and all suddenly flew from the garden. I've said before that I only ever see rooks in my garden during the breeding season, when they have chicks to feed. I think the thing that's brought them into my garden at the moment is these half-coconut shells filled with suet. They must be able to smell it from some way away, but it doesn't have an odour that I can notice. Anyway, I was really pleased to have seen this example of rook behaviour. I appeared on the Bill Buckley programme on BBC Radio Berkshire just before Christmas, to talk about what to feed garden birds over the winter. Bill asked me two questions on air that I wasn't able to answer fully, so I've looked into them further to find the answers. I love challenges like this because it helps me learn more about bird behaviour. Bill walks along a river on the way to the studio and he asked me some questions about the swans and ducks he sees. His first question was, why do some swans swim with their wings up as though they have made an enclosure to keep their babies in, but when there are no babies at this time of year? I suggested it was part of their mating display, showing themselves to be big and fearsome, and I thought it was only the males that do this. I've since found out that both males and females arch their wings, and that it may be a dominance or a courtship display, and it's not restricted to the breeding season. Bill also asked me whether it's only females that carry baby swans or cygnets on their back, but apparently both parents do this. I've seen lots of photos and videos of this happening, but I've never seen it for myself, and it's one of the things I'm going to look out for this year. The other question Bill had concerned ducks. He sometimes sees male ducks suddenly swim very fast for about six feet, then stop and tread water for a little while, before steaming ahead again, and to his eye it seems for no great purpose. Bill wondered what that behaviour meant. Well, I couldn't answer that question, but I've done some research and found an academic paper on eider ducks by Goff, Farina and Fish, the references in the show notes, which describes the physics of swimming at the surface. 
Ducks are subject to drag by the water and can only reach a specific speed. However, they can go faster by hydroplaning, lifting their body a little out of the water and paddling, or by using their wings and feet to do something called paddle-assisted flying, which happens close to the water's surface and isn't actual flying. Maybe the birds that Bill sees are doing one of these. In either case, it sounds like it needs a lot of energy, and this may be why it happens in short bursts. If anyone has a more complete explanation, please do let me know. This week, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Cheel to the show. Paul is the host of Fighting Through podcast and has been a listener of my show for quite some time. I love hearing his descriptions of the birds he sees in his garden. I invited him to tell us more about the birds that have been visiting. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast. Hi, Susie, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we've spoken several times over social media, and I know that you've told me about some of the birds that you have in your garden. Could you tell me a little bit about where you live, what kind of location it is? Yes, I live in England, in Norfolk, um, towards the coast, the Norfolk Broads. So there's quite a lot of wildlife around in that area. Um, although sometimes I struggle to attract any of it to my garden. But, but um, I've got a, a reasonably decent sized back garden. And over the last few years, I've taken more of an interest in the birds. And uh, I'm gradually compiling a list of, of what comes into the garden. Because if, if you see one you don't recognize, then uh, it's nice just to look it up and then write down what it is. So, yeah, I've got a, acquired a list of about 20 in the recent past. Oh, wow. Have you got any that you consider to be quite unusual? Um, Well, uh, probably the most unusual one and probably my favourite is a jay. Um, Last winter was quite a harsh winter and uh, the birds were really on the back feet, (laughs) if they've got such a thing, um, in terms of surviving. So I I took an extra interest in uh, looking after them and changing the water and putting food out. And one particularly cold morning, a jay perched on the fence and I'd never ever seen one before and not since. And, uh, but it was just, uh, seemed like it was surveying its surroundings in some majestic fashion. Um, and it stayed for about three minutes and then disappeared and it didn't actually stop to feed. And, uh, I've since found out actually that that Jay's quite like acorns. So uh, when I've been out on my regular bike rides uh, during the autumn, I've been collecting <laughs> collecting acorns. Aww. So that uh, if we do get a, a dump down of snow, I'll I'll put some acorns out and see if uh, see if I can attract him back. Oh, wonderful! Another thing that you might think of doing is uh, they particularly like those peanuts in shells. You know the ones that you can get from the supermarket. All right, um, yes. Those are extremely popular now. They may well be popular if you've got any squirrels as well. But yes. uh, I've actually started putting some of those in. You know the um, suet cages that you get, the sort of yes. um, square block suet. I've actually started yes. putting the uh, peanuts in those, uh, the ones that are in the shell, because yep. uh, the, the tits can get to the shell and, and break the shell open and get the nuts out. Uh, the magpies and rooks also come to it in my garden. And, right. um, well, the squirrel comes as well. And I feel like it's an easier way for him to only get one at a time rather than just get all of the nuts at once. Gorge um, on them, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I interrupted you. What other, what other birds have you had? I mean, the jay's beautiful and I, I do – I think you sent a photograph, didn't you, into the group? I've- um, I think I did, yeah. Um, yeah, the, well, you just mentioned uh, crows, I think, and that leads me on to the fact that I, I've observed a few crows and uh, they, they're they strange to watch because the, one time they, they're feasting like there was no end to the food that was available. And other times, I, strangely, I could have sworn I saw a crow swoop down a few times on one of the uh, feeders that was hanging in the tree and spill the food out to feed the birds on the ground. Because it seemed like it, it flew to it, didn't really seem to make any attempt to get onto it to feed from. It just knocked it. So then all, all, all the food came tumbling down and there were other ground feeders eating it. And it did it a few times. And I thought, well, mate, is that a characteristic of the crow to be to help other birds? You yeah, not come no, across that? Uh, no. It's interesting you describe the behaviour, though. So I don't think they're benevolent. So I don't think they were saying, hey, guys. 
I'm <laughs> helping you out here. Um, but I do wonder if it was flying at the feeder to see whether it could knock the feeder off because what uh, I've had in my garden is I've had the rooks in and they've actually lifted feeders off the – I've got like shepherd crook type uh, pole yeah. Yeah. and I've actually had them lift the feeder off and drop it on the ground because then it's given them further access to the seed inside. Yeah. So I think they are actually – clever enough to work out uh, that this seed is something they want but they can't quite get yes. so maybe they were a couple of failed attempts at, yeah. at trying to just drop it on the floor well they'll never manage that because i've created my own shepherd's crooks by uh, i got some sort of thin thinnish wire thin enough to bend and i tend to hang the wire from the tree and then i hang the feeder from the wire ah. and it makes it quite awkward for the squirrels to get to the food as well oh, um, very clever and of course, you can make as deep a hook as you like so that they'll never unhook it in a million years. Oh, so they may have tried this in other gardens and thought they'd, they'd try it in yours and, uh, Could be. Yeah. and been, been foiled, <laughs> foiled Crouchy by your... devils. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the most regular visitors to your garden? Um, depends on the time of year. At the moment, all I seem to be attracting is pigeons. Uh-huh. Um after a fairly fallow summer, I've started putting food out recently again. And, uh, yeah, the pigeons are in, in out in droves and the squirrels and not much else. But um, when they do get more frequent, the last season, the, the great tits were very frequent feeders. Um, in fact, I'm sure they were nesting somewhere in the vicinity because they were backwards and forwards every 30 seconds, taking some nuts from a feeder and then disappearing and then coming back. Oh, right. And uh, so, yeah, great tits. Uh, quite well serviced by goldfinches as well, which oh, uh, are extraordinarily beautiful uh, finch. Um, in fact, until I started getting those in the garden, I don't really think I'd ever seen one in my life. So that, that's rather nice. With a, You can probably describe a goldfinch plumage better than I can, but it's got some splashes of red and yellow in it. Rather nice. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can always refer people back as well to my goldfinch episode, but um, oh right, but, good. But no, yeah, they're, they're they are really a striking bird, and I think that they've been one of the birds that have been more frequently noted in gardens in the last few years, um, right. because it used to be extremely rare to to see them, or it felt like it was extremely rare to see them in gardens. Right. But I get possibly only three to four a day, but sometimes, depending on the time of year, you know, I get a much larger flock in or feeding i've got a six port feeder and i can have one on each port and others in the garden waiting for their turn as well i find that they particularly like sunflower hearts i think they say that they will also eat niger seed or black thistle seed right and they definitely have eaten that in my garden in the past but i find that it's a seed that the feeders tend to have a very specialized opening that matches what a goldfinch can use Right. Uh, similar to when they're teasing out the seeds of uh, flower heads. Yeah. But I find that the seed tends to go moldy before it gets eaten. So yeah. I've stopped feeding that type of seed now. And I just use the sunflower hearts, which are beloved of a large variety of but birds. I was going to say the same thing. That seems to be the uh, perennial favourite. And they're the more expensive as well, aren't they? <laughs> of so <course>. yes. <laughs> Birds have obviously got expensive <laughs> tastes. Uh, the good thing about it is that because they don't have the sunflower shell around them, you don't have all the mess under the feeder. But it's great if they're eating the seeds frequently so that it's going down. But again, they also can go mouldy over a period of time. Um, so it is important to keep those feeders free flowing. You know, we've had a run of really wet, horrible days and I've had to keep going out and shaking the feeder to make sure that the food has dropped down inside the feeder. Ah, uh, right. That's a good tip. Yeah, it's not very pleasant having to go out there and it's wet and the tree shakes yeah. on you and all the rest of it. But otherwise they go to the feeder and they can see the seed in there, but can't shake the seed enough to get it down to eat yeah. it. I find that with fat balls. Um, just yesterday I threw some old mildewed fat balls out and replaced them with fresh ones. And I mean, you always think that fat will sustain itself and not go off because it's fat but i do think they go a bit grotty after a while it's tempting to put stuff out and just leave it yeah. um but if you find that the food isn't going down there's generally a reason why it's not going down especially if you're used to getting birds in the garden right. and i think it's generally that they won't eat the food if it's gone off so uh, yeah. best yeah. thing is just to sort of and it's hard to do to think i've got a tube of seed there but i think it's gone a bit moldy but you just yeah. have to throw it away it's not worth risking the health of the birds on it 
And if you yeah. have got a couple of sickly birds, they might be tempted to, to feed on on the food. And, um, you know, that's not great because it will just yeah. keep them in the garden longer and uh, spread the disease. You said you um, had a, was it a six port feeder or a four port feeder? Yeah, ago. so I've got a couple of different ones. So I've got a six port one that I bought recently. It's quite a long one. Um, so it does take quite a lot of food, but um, I still have to fill that one up weekly. And, and you I've found got, the birds uh, queue up to use it, do you? Yeah, what's interesting Gosh. about this new feeder, it's got flat perches and it's I've bought some perch rings to go on the flat perches. It seems that the perches are ideal for the robins and dunnocks and they've actually taken to taking seed from the feeder which is pretty amazing they've clearly been watching other birds do it over time and this is the first time they've had a perch that they can sit on um moving on to my sort of favored species it's running short now but the the wagtail is a regular winter visitor and uh i just don't always amuse myself watching them wiggle the way around the lawn grubbing away at whatever they can find and uh Funny one thing, when we had this really cold snap and the the bird bath was uh, frozen over and I was out there every morning with a hot kettle melting it, but there's one little wagtail turned up one day and he hung hung around for about two or three days, barely moving from this um, water bath. And he was continually sort of popping around this in circles. And I don't know why it was there, whether it was dehydrated and it was just trying to make sure it, didn't get dehydrated again but eventually it went uh, or a fox got it I don't know but um, it was strange behavior. I do wonder if maybe it had been a little bit sickly and it was just that it found some open water and it was just staying Could nearby be. because yeah. of that. I'm heartened to hear you say that you go out and melt the water for them because people often forget that water is actually a really key thing for birds even in the winter and, yeah. uh, and making sure that there's fresh water available that can bring birds to your garden even if you don't put food out so for some people who might be concerned about having rodents uh, in the garden and don't want to leave seed out, you can you can feed small amounts of seed during the day and uh, just make sure that you've always got water around that's um, fresh for them. Um, yeah. And that'll make it a, a place for, for birds to come to your garden. I think the last on my list is uh, a pheasant. And uh, we call him Big Boy because he comes strutting around uh, wandering around finding what he can to eat and uh, there's a Mrs Big Boy accompanies him and uh, sometimes there are two two ladies accompanying him and he's he's always great to watch because he's he's such a beautiful bird and uh, one morning we found him pecking at the patio windows and I'm not sure whether that because he he was giving us a wake-up call to say he wanted some food or whether he whether there's some other reason but have you any views on that? Uh, do you think the sun might have been allowing him to see his reflection in the window? Um, oh, so he thought it was it was a mirror. Of, oh, yeah, okay. or or another male. You know, maybe he was thinking he needed to um, ah, check it out to see whether it was a rival. Could be. It might just be that he was asking for seed that he'd worked out <laughs> where where the seed came from and uh, was asking for it. It's funny you, you can go nowhere near them when they're out there. The slightest disturbance, and they're off up to the, the other end of the garden. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm still. We've got a red-legged partridge that's been uh, visiting the garden since April, and uh, she's still coming around. Um, I really hope she'll survive the winter. Uh, it's I, I, you know it's such an unusual thing to see. We've got quite a suburban garden. We don't back onto fields or anything like that. It was. Uh, I think a pure fluke that she turned up in the garden and she's she stayed in the neighbourhood because she's found food and water and you know protection. But she's still there. She's still she was out there Fantastic. this morning in the rain and wind. And um, but she originally had a mate with her, and he was a lot more trusting. So he would stay still when you went out to put food out. She's always been a bit more nervous. And interestingly, right. over time, she's got even more nervous. So now, just as soon as I open the back door to put seed out, if she's in the garden, she's away, which I'm pleased about because it means she hasn't become habituated to the humans that she must meet uh, while uh, she's in yeah. the neighbourhood. But yeah. at the same time, you feel like, oh, I've been feeding you for six months. You think you might at least say hello, um, <laughs> <laughs> stay around yeah. a bit while I'm in the garden. I'm not so, rude. Exactly. so rude. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, she's a wild animal, so... I put a, a garden camera in on a oh. tree uh, a few weeks back and uh, it was really to try and capture a hedgehog because we, we put a, 
like a hedgehog house um, in the garden, and I put some food out, thinking, oh, we'll, we'll get all the local hedgehogs coming around for a party, but uh, not so. I hadn't seen a single hedgehog, but we have seen the pheasant. We've seen a cat, squirrels, and I think an owl. This was, The owl yeah. was a night shot, and it's very difficult to make out the, the outline, but it, it looks very owl-like to me. Oh, wow. And, yeah, it's fantastic. I hope it is. I, you know, I'll, I'll persevere, and certainly if uh, if I come up trumps with that, I'll I'll post it in the forum. Oh yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I've been doing something similar. I've got a wildlife camera out in the garden at the moment because I bought a hedgehog box this year, and I think I've got one in there. I don't want to open the box to find out. I don't want to disturb it. But the other day, I've set the camera to only film at night because uh, the partridge tends to sit in front of the camera during the day and I just have hundreds of videos of her sitting there preening. Um, But uh, my husband called me the other day to say there was a hedgehog in the garden and this was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was getting towards dusk, but it was still daylight. And I thought, oh no, this is, you know, they're not supposed to be out in the daytime. I hope I haven't got a sickly one in the garden. So I went out to have a look and it was quite a small one, but he went straight over to the house. He'd clearly been there and uh, I saw him grabbing some leaves and taking them in with him. And I was, oh. I was thrilled because it means he's been taking leaves in to nest in there. Oh, or to Sorry, to hibernate. So I, I need to, when it stops raining, I need to go out and actually take the disc out of my camera to see what's been happening. Um, but I, I'm thrilled to think, I think I might have a hedgehog actually in my house. But oh. as I say, I could open it and have a look, but I really don't want to because I don't want to disturb it and scare it off. And it might yeah. be hibernating now. I did um, hear one little tip uh, a while back that if you want to know if anything's going in or out of the house, the hedgehog house, to put a, a one or two twigs vertically against the entrance, then if anything does go in or out, it'll push the pig twigs apart and that'll be a, a telltale giveaway. It oh, doesn't right. necessarily guarantee that it's a hedgehog, I guess, but um no i mean considering we've had a cat virtually every single night uh walking around the hedgehog box pretty much every trigger of my film was the cat i don't even know whose cat it is but it's like no i don't want to see a cat i want to see the hedgehog Uh, i've just had one really good uh image of the hedgehog which i posted i did see the hedgehog video it was smashing oh thank yes i was so excited especially as it looks like it was waiting for the cat to disappear before it then ran into the <laughs> ran into the house. Yeah. The only other non-bird species we've uh, captured, and it's rather nice, was a monk jack, oh. and that was at night. Oh wow! Do you back onto farmland? Uh, not really. There, it's uh, well, yes, indirectly. It's like woodland, woodlandy farmland stuff. I'm oh. not sure what it is. It's just trees and generally overgrown so uh, it is quite a good habitat for wildlife i guess oh fantastic oh the other thing i wanted to ask is do you get any woodpeckers in your garden i've got one on my list yes uh, very occasionally and obviously you know you've got a woodpecker because of the noise um <laughs> and we've i've actually got a photograph of it feeding at the bird feeder what was it eating oh pretty sure it would have been sunflower kernels Ah, interesting. So one thing that I know woodpeckers are very fond of are those suet blocks. I mentioned earlier about the suet cages. Right. So uh, it might be worth you thinking over the winter of putting out at least one of those um, suet cages with the suet right. block inside. Um, right. That will definitely uh, attract woodpeckers and all the tits and everything will, will like those. Um, um, you yeah. might even find some of the crows trying to land on it or the corvids, so magpies, jays. Jays potentially might if they come in the garden for the nuts that you're going to put out for them. The other tip I'd give is if you're going to buy those fat balls, don't get them in the little netting uh, things. Or if you do, take them out of the netting and put them into a a feeder holder because uh, I've seen quite a few pictures of birds getting their feet tangled in the netting and not being able to be rescued in time. So. Uh The plastic netting is not ideal, but the but the fat balls. Uh, I would also encourage with the fat balls not to go for the cheapest because they tend to be a large proportion of sand or grit in the in the ball rather than suet. Ah. Um, so I think actually the best suet to make is your own suet, yes. where you can buy the suet um, in the supermarket quite cheaply and then add in oats and seeds and um, other treats. I, I sometimes put peanut butter in, non-salted peanut butter in as well. Right. Um, Excellent. Um, so, Paul, um, thank you so much for sharing all your 
uh, bird stories with us. Um, it's a pleasure. I know originally you said, oh, I only get a couple of birds, but actually you've had so many stories there about the things you're seeing. And um, and I'd love you to keep sharing your stories with us, um, either in the group or sending me messages that I can read out on the show. Um, so it'll now, be a pleasure, yeah. Thank you. Now, you have your own podcast. Would you like to tell me a bit about that and where people might find you if they want to listen to it? I do, certainly. Um, it's called Fighting Through, and it's based on uh, a book that I had published based on my dad's World War II. Um, he wrote it. He wrote the memoirs a few years back now, and it's called uh, Fighting Through from Dunkirk to Hamburg. And on the back of publish- publishing the book, I built a website and went on to produce the podcast. And uh, the podcast essentially... Uh, giving you the stories behind Dad's story. Um, He fought at Dunkirk, North Africa, D-Day and others. And uh, gradually, uh, other memoirs and memories of veterans connected to Dad's war in some way have trickled in. So, uh, for example, I've had a memoir of the captain of the ship that saved him from the beaches of Dunkirk. I've had a memoir superb memoir written by some chap who was an engineer on board one of the little ships of Dunkirk. Uh, that same guy fought at Gallipoli in World War I, and he wrote an absolutely fantastic memoir about the uh, the brutal battle of Gallipoli. And uh, they're all very popular stories. And, um, yeah, it's it's going from strength to strength, really. That's absolutely amazing. And and how wonderful that these other people are contacting you to share their stories on the back of the memoirs of your dads. Whereabouts can they find your podcast? Well, on any podcast listener, really, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, or any other listeners that work or you can go to the uh, website fightingthroughpodcasts.co.uk and that's got a list of all the podcasts with uh, easy links to the players as well fantastic i'll put the link for that in the show as well so people can easily uh, find you thank you so much for speaking with us today and uh, i look forward to us catching up again in the future so do i Susie. it was a pleasure being on and thank you do have a listen to the stories paul tells in his podcast They are ones that should not be forgotten. So it's a new year. What plans do you have for birding in 2019? Do you keep lists of your garden birds or of the birds you see on your regular walks? I mentioned in my episode with Lev Perikian that I was going to try and make more of an effort with recording the birds I see this year. So far, I've started a year list and a 2019 garden list. The lists are really just for my own enjoyment and to note if new species come along. I have regularly been taking part in the BTO's Garden Bird Watch, and I've seen 14 species in my garden so far this year. I'll list those in the show notes. And I can expect to see at least six more species as the year goes on. It'll be interesting to note any unusual ones. Last year I had the field fair... So although that's on my garden life list, unless I'm very lucky, it won't appear in 2019's garden list. For now, though, I'm pleased to say that the red leg partridge is still visiting my garden. The Big Garden Bird Watch is happening on the weekend of the 26th to the 28th of January. Will you be taking part? If you're in the UK, there's still time to get your free pack from the RSPB. Sign up at www rspb.org I asked on Twitter and Facebook what birds people have been excited to see this week. Susan, host of Dead Ladies Show podcast, is currently in Florida. She told me she'd seen green heron, wood storks, anhinga, great blue herons and little blue herons. She had quite a lot of herons there and uh, quite a few species that I've never seen. So I'm guessing that Florida needs to be on my list. Jeremy, in Washington State, said, I was visiting my parents for the holiday weekend and we all got some wonderful close-up views of an Anna's hummingbird feeding at their feeder. Ian from Melbourne tweeted, The rainbow lorikeets here in Melbourne are always a delight. I remember seeing rainbow lorikeets when we went to Sydney a few years ago and they are incredibly highly coloured birds and yet the tree that we saw them in 
had leaves and flowers of similar colours. And so they were actually really well camouflaged within the tree. And I'll never forget that sight when I realised how many of those birds were actually in the tree. And I hadn't seen them at first because of the camouflage. I'd heard them, mind you. Northern Gardener on Twitter said, To be honest, all the birds I've seen I'm excited about. At the moment, I go to work in the dark and come home in the dark. So this week, being around in the light and seeing the birds has been really nice. Mostly magpies and gulls, I have to admit. Heather, from Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast, lives in New Zealand. And she says, My favourite is the local sacred kingfisher that sits on a fence post and rests there in the early evenings. Adriel from West New York State saw a cedar waxwing pair bonding by passing berries back and forth with their beaks. After a few passes, the berry is eaten and a new one found and shared. That's a lovely piece of behaviour that's been noted there. And um, I love waxwings anyway. But uh, what a great thing to see. Alan from Georgia has been spending some time on St Simon's Island just off the coast of Georgia. And an early morning walk gave him cormorants, storks, starlings, boat-tailed grackles, house sparrows, gulls, pelicans, probably brown pelicans, he says, morning doves and pigeons. And he told me later that he heard a red-bellied woodpecker calling. And then he also heard a loud jackhammer knock and he thought that was his pterodactyl friend. And I think by that he means the pileated woodpecker. But... Then he said it just came out of a tree and it was a hairy or a downy woodpecker. So that was a big surprise. The woodpecker must have been knocking on something very um, hollow. I'd love to know what birds you've seen this week. Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode or post your photos of the birds you've seen. I really do enjoy hearing your tales, so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Casual Birder Pod or on Instagram at Casual Birder Podcast. And you can email me at casualbirderpod at gmail.com. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen. And if you enjoy the show, please consider posting about it on social media. Personal recommendation is such a valuable way of helping others to find the show. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of The Casual Birder Podcast.